<laughs> All right, everyone, uh, welcome. Good afternoon, good late afternoon. Thank you for braving the rain uh, this afternoon. My name is Roberto Delgado. I am a first year AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow placed at the National Science Foundation, uh, co-organizer of this event with Sarah Carlson, uh, second year fellow from USAID. Um, and I'm also co-lead of the AAAS Biodiversity Affinity Group, um, co-sponsors of this event as well with AAAS. Um, since we have a full schedule of distinguished guests to speak today, um, I'll just give you a few brief remarks, uh, tell you a little bit more about the Biodiversity Affinity Group, one of the professional development network associations within the AAAS Policy Fellowship Program dedicated to uh, understanding and um, examining biodiversity conservation in many different facets. Um, today, we have the topic of why biodiversity matters to the U.S. government, and the main objectives is really to inform uh, the, broader co the broader conservation community about some important initiatives and programs existing that are part of different U.S. federal agencies, uh, and we narrowed the choice of agencies to those that, uh, several that host uh, U.S. Uh, AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellows, and also those that were receptive and uh, willing to share and be generous with their time to join us and present on their programs. Um, before I get started with some brief introductions, uh, I want to thank uh, a number of people and organizations. First of all, AAAS for hosting us, th providing this venue, and in particular, Eddie Gonzalez, uh, the Program Director for Professional Development, and Christine F Fusco, uh, Project Coordinator, who uh, did all the behind-the-scenes magic of organizing, coordinating this wonderful event, and providing light refreshments for us after our session. Um, I want to thank also Sarah Carlson, co-organizer, um, was really kind of the motivation behind the this, this whole, holding this panel event because from uh, earlier previous conversations, she describing frustrations uh, in conversations with with friends and colleagues who didn't know that several agencies uh, within the U.S. federal government do a lot for biodiversity conservation. Um, I also want to thank several other current and former fellows uh, who helped with in coordinating this program. Uh, either by uh, helping to organize and contact prospective speakers and promoting the event. These include uh, Marlene Cole, who's the other co-lead from the Biodiversity Affinity Group, um, Tony Mata at uh, USDA, uh, Allison Leidner at NASA, uh, Karen Alroy at NSF, and um, also Beth Stauffer and Barbara Martinez at EPA. Although we don't have an EPA representative, we really tried very hard to get one. Uh, and hopefully, if we have a follow-up event in the fall, we'll, we'll have that representation. So without further ado, I want to uh, give some very brief introductions to our, our, our panelists. Um, each will present for approximately 10 minutes on uh, strategic advantages of their agencies in, deal in addressing biodiversity conservation, uh, give an example or two of existing initiatives and programs that they have for biodiversity. Um, and and then we uh, will conclude the evening with uh, some discussion facilitated by myself, uh, hopefully with an opportunity to take questions from the audience, and then we'll retire for like refreshments uh, in, the, in the lobby. So um, you have full uh, descriptions, full bios of the speakers in the handouts, but I'll just say a few brief things. Um, to my immediate left, we have Dr. Sandy Boyce uh, from the U.S. Forest Service. National Wild He's the National Wildlife Ecologist based here in, the U in D.C. Uh, next to him, we have Dr. Peter Bredding, a Senior National Program Leader for the Plant Germplasm and Genomes Office of the Agricultural Research Service of the USDA. Next to him, at his left, is Dr. Barbara Best. Uh, she's Senior Coastal Resource Management and Policy Advisor for the Forestry and Biodiversity Office at USAID, Agency for International Development. To her left, Gabrielle Canonico. Uh, she is the Regional Coordinator in the U.S. Uh, for the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System Program of NOAA. Uh, next to her, we have Woody Turner, a Program Scientist for the Biological Diversity. He is the Program uh, excuse me, Program Scientist for Biological Diversity and Program Manager for the Ecological Forecasting in the NASA Headquarters Science Mission Directorate. Uh, and at the end of the table, Dr. Pen Penelope Firth, Penny Firth, uh, is Division Director of the Environmental Biology Division at NSF and involved with the Dimensions in Biodiversity Program. So, my screen went dead. I will invite Dr. Boyce to come to the podium and begin the presentation. You can use the lectern or you can roam around with a free mic. Do you have a, a, an option? Oh, I can. Okay. Right. And you can advance the slides forward, re reverse the slides back, and here's the pointer at the top. <laughs> okay. I'm going to sit right here in the front right and give you a 
five minute warning and then a two minute warning okay. after 10 minutes. I'm gonna stand up. Okay, okay great. Right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Kurt Flather with the Rocky Mountain Research Station and I sort of collaborated on uh, this presentation, and this is a slide Kurt put together. It's Nature Serves uh, G1, G2 uh, rankings for species and their distribution across the continental United States. And we wanted to show uh, the, the uh, National Forest System lands overlaid on top of this, so let's see if it works. Ah, okay, there you can see. The importance of the National Forest System lands uh, with regard to biodiversity across the nation. You see we have quite a few uh, correlated locations, so it's pretty important uh, for the management of biodiversity. And in fact, if, if I remember right, the IPCC report said that mountainous terrain was one of those uh, areas where biodiversity uh, could be compromised in the future. So we have a lot of that mountain, mountainous terrain. Let's see. Okay. The Forest Service mission has in its mission statement uh, the, to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands. Now this mission statement comes directly from Congress that passed a law in 1974 requiring the agency to maintain diversity. It's not optional for us, we have to do it. Uh, the Forest Service manages a tremendous variety of habitats from tundra to desert and everything in between. And we also have a really well-trained workforce. Um, we have you know, soil scientists, hydrologists, biologists, botanists, ecologists. Um, all of us uh, in the agency work together to try to maintain biodiversity um, and also do it in a way that maintains a multiple use um, uh, mission of the agency. So it, it's, we don't maximize it necessarily, but we try to balance it with society's other social and economic needs for the landscape. So the Forest and Rangeland Renewable Resource Planning Act of 1974, and then we have Section 6G, says we must uh, provide for the diversity of plant and animal communities based on the suitability and capability of the specific land area in order to meet overall multiple use. And also, interestingly enough, in the amended 1990 version, we have to account for the effects of global climate change on forest and rangeland conditions. And this is interesting because uh, f f for a long time I had no idea that this provision was in there, but there it sits. So we've been thinking about this for a long time. Now we implement Congress's intent by creating <coughs> regulations, and this is our understanding of what Congress means when they, when they ask us to maintain diversity on the landscape. So we have these provisions in the 1982 planning rule, 36 CFR 21919. It includes two important provisions. The first one deals with viability of species, and the second one deals with management indicator species, which are selected to uh, detect the effects of management activities of the agency on the landscape. But here you can see the first one is, is uh, we will manage habitat to maintain viable populations of existing native and desired non-native vertebrate species in the planning area. If you follow the agency's history at all, uh, in the last 20 or so years, you know that we've been in court a lot uh, over how we manage landscapes to maintain viability, particularly um, this notion of management indicator species, which I don't have time to go into. Uh, viable populations shall be regarded as those which have the estimated numbers and distributions to ensure their continued existence is well distributed in the planning area. For us, in the planning area means within the boundary of the forest for which that planning document was created. In order to ensure viable populations, uh, we must provide habitat for them. And so we focus not so much on the animals, but more on maintaining the habitat. In 2012, we created a new planning rule. So that last one was 1982. 
Fast forward to 2012, and we're, we are now uh, managing for the diversity of plant and animal communities, but we're doing it with a coarse filter, fine filter approach. So we want to maintain ecological integrity now, and we define ecological integrity in terms of species composition, structure of the ecosystem, its function, process, and uh, connectivity. So that's a tall order. That's the coarse filter. The fine filter piece is those uh, pieces which a coarse filter may not pick up, and we call those species a conservation concern, and those might be your rare, threatened, or uh, unusual species for which the coarse filter approach won't detect what's happening with them. And here is our definition for species of conservation concern. This list is put together by the regional forester, that's the top executive in the region, with input from uh, anybody and everybody who has an opinion about which species are not likely to be managed through the coarse filter approach. And everybody will have an opportunity to weigh in on, on what that list might look like for the area in which they live. We also have a requirement that in 2016, we have to have new monitoring programs on each forest in the nation. And um, we need for those monitoring programs to monitor focal species and then species of conservation concern. And you can see here that we have a select set of ecological conditions that we're gonna pay attention to as well for threatened, endangered, sensitive species, candidate and proposed species to maintain a viable, a viable population of each species of conservation concern. The NFS lands are a working landscape uh, to benefit societal needs. So there are a lot of competing interests, social interests, economic interests, ecological interests, conservation interests, all vying for uh, their perspective that that perspective sort of dominate what happens on the landscape. And so there's a lot of conflict that the agency has to, to work through in order to try to provide for that diversity sustained, diversity of, of species and communities sustained through time. Now, at-risk species are often found on NFS lands because we have a lighter management activity on the landscape than typically occurs on private lands that surround the Forest Service. So people think of us as always in conflict, but in fact, we do a pretty good job in conserving uh, species compared to what's happening on the landscape around. And, and the new planning rule does something different as well. It calls for us to look beyond the boundary of our forest to understand what's happening there so that when we make a management decision, we have the context for understanding the effects of that management dis decision both within and outside the forest boundaries. So that's a, that's a huge difference, and it's a very positive difference that, that we now have in the planning rule. Um, we have conservation approaches, thanks, conservation approaches from reserve designs, like on the Tongass National Forest where we have small reserves, medium and large reserves, all spatially allocated across the landscape or in the southwest of the United States where we have a much better understanding of how the ecosystems function, we have a more hands-on approach because we have greater confidence in our knowledge and our ability to apply correct management actions there. So it varies based on the knowledge that we have available to us. And we have a number of ongoing uh, initiatives right now, collaborative forest, landscape restoration, these are buzzwords, integrated resource restoration. Of course, Congress is funding this and directing us to do this. We have a watershed condition framework where we have evaluated the watersheds across all national forest system lands as to their, their status, and from that status, then we can make decisions on allocation of resources to restore them or improve their condition class. We're working on a terrestrial, terrestrial condition assessment right now to overlay on top of those six code hucks, which are about 10,000 acres in size, the terrestrial units are gonna be about 60,000 acres in size. You may have several in one six code huck. It's complicated work, but we're working on it. So what does success look like? 
Well, we have to have good inventory data sets, good monitoring data sets, a good assessment process. The planning rule has three components, an assessment, a planning, and a monitoring process. The data that we collect, we want them to be compatible with other governmental and non-governmental organizations. This is an outcome that we want to achieve. Nature Serve, of course, we want to make sure we're compatible with their work. And then, ultimately, we want to make sure that biodiversity is maintained across the landscapes that we manage. Thank you. We'll reserve questions until the end. Uh, next, if I can have Dr. Peter Breding. Let's see if I can get here. All righty. And same job. Well, thank you, Roberto and uh, Sarah, for inviting me, and thanks to the AAAS fellows for taking out time from your, your busy schedule to, uh, to listen to us as we describe uh, how our agencies are involved in, in biodiversity. I sort of switched around the title. Uh, the, the sign title was, Why is Biodiversity Important to Your Agency? But rather, I'm going to widen it and, and show you why it's important to agriculture and, of course, <coughs> touch on why agriculture is important to all of us. So why does it matter? Well, at present, uh, more than 850 million of us, of we humans, uh, are, are hungry. And uh, that's a population of 7.1 billion. Uh, and by 2050, uh, there'll be 9 billion of us. And they all have to be fed, probably on pretty much the same uh, area of land, especially if we want to conserve some of the, the, the forests and uh, uh, native grasslands that, that uh, we have currently. So to grow more food on the same land area, you have to incre increase production. There's two primary ways to do that, to have better management practices, uh, more efficient use of inputs, and to have more productive animals and and agricultural animals and, and, and plants that use the inputs more effectively. So following that line, uh, if you have more productive uh, livestock and, and plants, uh, the way you get there is through genetic improvement and breeding, and that requires new genes, new alleles, new combinations of genes, and the source of these is agricultural biodiversity. And it comes in quite a few different forms. Uh, it can be the so the elite, highly bred uh, genetic resources that uh, are in a, a seed companies' uh, stores of, of seeds. It could be farmer varieties, heirloom varieties, uh, and wild relatives of crops and livestock that one can intercross either by traditional means or by uh, biotechnology. So, not surprisingly, Agricultural bi biodiversity matters a lot to the Agricultural Research Service. Not only through this line of reasoning, but as we saw from the early, earlier talk, there are, there's legislation that, that uh, if we weren't interested, would make sure we were. So the F 1990 Farm Bill charges us with the federal responsibility for conserving and facilitating the use of this agricultural biodiversity that uh, underpins global agriculture. And the way we do that is to conserve them in gene banks. And here are uh, two examples of our gene banks. Uh, the one on the left is uh, at Fort Collins, Colorado. It's our high security uh, adv advanced uh, site for keeping materials under uh, low temperatures, either in this case on the left, uh, you see uh, semen or ova or embryos of animals being immersed in liquid nitrogen and then uh, massive quantities of seeds that are uh, maintained in about uh, minus 18 degrees Celsius. So the idea is you, you uh, decrease the temperature uh, without, without killing the, the propagules, and you slow down the metabolism, and you increase the longevity. But it's not only putting the germplasm, the genetic resources in the can in the cold. Our gene banks do much more than that. They acquire the materials. They maintain them, as you saw. 
uh, when we run out of seeds or we deplete the, the supplies of animal germplasm, we have to regenerate them. Uh, the data that accompanies it is oftentimes just as important as the genetic resource for breeding or, or research. And we distribute the materials. It's not, these are not museums. We distribute many thousands of, of uh, samples. We also add value to them by characterizing them genetically, evaluating their agricultural utility. In some cases, we conduct the first stages <coughs> of, of breeding genetic enhancement. And for all that, we conduct applied research to do all those activities more efficiently and effectively. So to sum up, we keep the material safe and encourage their use in research, uh, production, and, uh, and uh, other uh, uses. So our, the collections in the US under USDRS are, are some of the largest in the world in terms of national collections. Our National Plant Germplasm System contains more than a half million uh, genetically distinct uh, samples of close to 15,000 species. On the livestock side, uh, there's uh, three quarters of a million uh, samples from 46 different agricultural species. Microbially, we focus on those microbes that are important from an agricultural context. They're either pathogens or they're they're, from, they're industrially important, they're fermenters, drug sources, or they're symbionts, such as nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Also, a thousand different strains of insects, beneficial in the case of honeybees or, or pest insects. I mentioned earlier, these materials are used heavily. For example, uh, last year, we distributed more than 250,000 separate samples uh, of plants, and the usage rate is similar for the other collections give you a little bit more of a context for our plant system, which is the largest. Uh, they're conserved in just under 20 different gene banks that are spread throughout the U.S. Uh, their locations are interposed on our, our plant hardiness zone map here, so you can see that they, they cover uh, the U.S. and include uh, gene banks in, uh, you see at, at the bottom in, in Gila, Hawaii, and also Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, and on uh, the south and north, Geneva and Pullman and all points in between. So uh, these materials are conserved statically. They're, they're put into a state of suspended animation. Uh, if, we, if we keep them in orchards, we tr also try to keep them from evolving so that they serve uh, researchers and breeders better. But this doesn't maintain their evolutionary trajectory. And we really depend on partnerships with other agencies for that. Since many of our crops originate elsewhere than the US, we have partnerships with international uh, organizations and, and, and uh, entities such as here. This is a wild relative of pear in the Republic of Georgia that we are conducting research on. And some of our researchers uh, shown in, in the, this slide are in the uh, rainforests of Peru looking for uh, cacao wild relatives, a source of chocolate. Uh, so as I mentioned, and to, to wrap up, interagency and intergovernmental partnerships are absolutely critical for this in-situ gene bank conservation and, and, and uh, in-situ success. So we partner with Forest Service, uh, B Bureau of Law Land Management, and, uh, National Park Service, AID, a number of state agencies and uh, breed <coughs> associations, cultivar uh, groups, and internationally with the, with the CGIR centers, which are the, the Green Revolution Centers, such as Samith and Erie Global Crop Diversity Trust, and uh, our counterparts in uh, developing and developed countries. One example, of recent example of the partnership is together with some international partners, uh, we uh, published the first inventory across the U.S. of, of crop wild relatives indicating where they were found, what their conservation status was approximately, and which would, would have priority for conserving either in situ or in gene banks. So with that, I'll uh, turn the stage over to the next speaker. Thank you, Peter.
Thank you. Um, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here uh, representing USAID. I started out at USAID as a AAAS fellow, and I'm really delighted to see how strong the program, the fellowship program, is still going. Now, USAID is an independent agency, and our administrator reports to the Secretary of State. It is the lead agency that's responsible for providing international assistance as well as disaster relief. We do have a congressional mandate, though, to also conserve biodiversity. In the Foreign Assistance Act, it calls for us to conserve biodiversity and forestry, recognizing that they are key attributes to sustainable development. Healthy and biodiverse ecosystems, particularly the goods and services they provide, really are important to many of the overall agency goals in food security, from wild fisheries to timber and, and other food products, to economic growth, democracy and governance, to climate um, mitigation and adaptation. Later this summer, we'll be launching a new USAID po uh, biodiversity policy that really embraces this concept that human development and well-being is dependent upon ecosystem goods and services. The policy recognizes that biodiversity has intrinsic value, but it also has value through those ecosystem goods and services, and that our durable development and our sustainable and resilient communities will depend upon valuing and safeguarding these resources. It also recognizes that the biodiversity loss disproportionately affects many of those who are so critically dependent upon natural resources and biodiversity. These can range from small-scale fishers to uh, farmers to foresters. Some of the challenges that we really address internationally is that these resources are international public goods, they're common resources. And so to really have effective conservation, when you have weak governance and weak institutions, is that you really need to have collaborative actions. It's about getting people energized and incentivized to conserve their resources. So these are some of the challenges that we face within the international context. So a lot of what we deal with are helping to set up those management and the governance structures that allow for conservation to occur. We also promote science and technology, but you need to have that framework, the decision-making framework in, when, in, in, in which those, that science in, information can be used. So a lot of our programs deal with governance. They deal with understanding what are the power relationships, who has access to the resources, who is misappropriating that power, and how can we build stronger collaborations as well as institutions to deal with that. So some of our comparative advantages deal with these larger development issues in which we work. We take a comprehensive and strategic approach, not just to addressing the immediate threats, say over harvesting of fish or timber, but trying to understand what are the underlying drivers that are leading to biodiversity loss. So we deal a lot with the, the government and the social side of, of management, um, building stronger institutions, building constituencies who demand better management and who want conservation. We also combine development and biodiversity conservation expertise, which is so critical in these developing countries. We have on the ground presence. Overall, we work in, I think, about 90 countries Many of our staff at our 80 plus missions are foreign service nationals. These are people from the host countries who understand the political, the social, the ecological, and the, and the cultural context in which we work. We have extensive network of partnerships. Overall, the agency works with about 3,500 different organizations. I wasn't able to get a number of how, how, how many conservation organizations or companies that we deal with. But it, it's many, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see some of our partners here in the audience today. We also tend to work in five-year program cycles, which is nice. It's not quite sufficient for many of these capacity building programs that we're engaged in. But we do have that longer time horizon than just a year-by-year -year progress. 
So for many of these re reasons, USAID is recognized as sort of an international leader in biodiversity conservation. We have other donors who turn to us for advice and other donors who will replicate some of our successful programs. We have a wide variety of active conservation initiatives. We work at the global, regional, national, and subnational scales. So we can address some of these particularly global drivers of, of biodiversity loss, such as wildlife trafficking, um, illegal timber and fisheries trade, we have some large regional initiatives going on in the Amazon Basin, the Central Africa Congo Basin, the Coral Triangle area, Central America and Lower Mekong. We also have other regional platforms which are supporting programs in East and West Africa, Southern Africa, Caribbean, Latin America, and um, East Asia and the Pacific. Um, one of my colleagues corrected me today. We have, I think, biodiversity programs in 55 countries presently. It fluctuates year by year. We're in the process of developing a biodiversity and development research agenda. We realize that biodiversity has intrinsic value. How do we make our programs more effective and how do we capture the impacts from those programs? But how do we also capture the co-benefits? Our programs are contributing to better governance. They are contributing to econo economic stability, social systems. So, so we're developing a research agenda that will allow us to capture those co-benefits as well. We're very active in combating wildlife trafficking. Uh, we have programs at the national level. We're on sort of the front line of defense trying to address the poachers, but also building capacity at the community level. For, for conservation. And we're also supporting the development of region-wide wildlife enforcement networks, trying to build capacity in the governments to address some of this illegal trafficking themselves. Later this summer, we're gonna be releasing or launching a new wildlife trafficking technology challenge. And Sarah has been very involved in developing this and we're quite excited by it. It will allow us to reach out and seek new and innovative ways and approaches, technologies that we might be able to use in our programs to address wildlife trafficking. It will also allow us to identify and reach out to what we call non-traditional partners, those we may not traditionally turn to. So we're quite excited about that. And let me just end by talking a little bit about science technology in our programs. Where possible, we do try to uh, bring in a really rigorous approach at the same time that we're building those governance frameworks in which we work. Uh, we take seascape and landscape approaches where possible, using things like ecosystem-based approaches to fisheries management. On the social science side, we're looking for innovative ways to really mobilize societies and communities to build those constituencies for, for conservation, using things like GES and DNA barcoding to really track trafficking, um, in timber and other products. And we're also building strong relationships with the universities, both with universities here in the US and universities in developing countries, but also doing institutional capacity building of universities in these countries in which we work. We see them as important centers of knowledge management, as well as a way to build up the capacity of the governance of the legal systems in which we work. And so we're quite excited about all of those activities as well. Thank you. So I'm gonna try speaking without slides this afternoon and I maybe regret not having some beautiful pictures because Noah works in some beautiful places. Um, so when I was invited here, um, I come from the National Ocean Service which is just one part of NOAA, which is a large agency with a large footprint across the nation. Um, but when I was invited here, I canvassed my colleagues about why biodiversity matters to the US government and to NOAA in particular. And one of them said to me, 
you should talk about how Elder Leopold got it right. And that really stuck because, of course, many of us have read Leopold in grad school. And my colleague was thinking of a Sand County Almanac, um, and he said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. This rings true to me, um, but boy, it can be hard to make the case for biodiversity, certainly in the policy community, um, and to argue why people should care. So I'm really glad for this opportunity and this forum and discussion um, today, so thank you. Uh, NOAA's mission is one of science, service, and stewardship. We're working to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts, share that knowledge and information with others, and conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. Um, we have a new administrator, Dr. Sullivan, um, with a, an amazing background. She's an astronaut. She's te technically very, very strong. Um, she calls this environmental intelligence, so we've all adopted that terminology, and her vision is that from the surface of the sun to the depths of the ocean, we're keeping our finger on the pulse of the changing planet, and we do this through a series of networks, and those could be observing networks, um, modeling networks, forecasts, assessments like integrated ecosystem assessments or st fishery stock assessments. We put environmental information into the hands of the public, decision makers, and really anyone who needs it. So biodiversity matters to NOAA because it informs really all of our efforts towards environmental intelligence. In the literature, more and more, um, we're reading that maintaining biodiversity is key to maintaining ecosystem services and sustaining ecosystem health and resilience in the face of environmental change, whether it's from natural or anthropogenic causes. I think in policy circles, consideration of marine and coastal biodiversity has traditionally lagged behind the, uh, the terrestrial and freshwater. But it's no less important from the perspective of ecosystem services, for sure, such as food and oxygen, socioeconomic benefits that support livelihoods, and a stable climate. This was recognized at the highest political level um, in the Ocean Policy Task Force final recommendations to the president in 2010. And through the national ocean policy, we're glad to see that it's become the policy of the United States to, quote, protect maintain and restore the health and biological diversity of ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes ecosystems and resources. The Census of Marine Life, which concluded in 2010, greatly in, in, enhanced our understanding of the status of marine biodiversity, and it also made clear the importance of um, systematic and sustainable approaches to observing and monitoring it across different levels at a national scale so that we can understand status and trends and changes and, and deal with those. Um, in the interagency context, um, with Woody and a colleague from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, I co-chair a working group on marine and coastal biodiversity um, that reports to the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology. Um, the group has 66 members, um, 33 are pretty active from a range of agencies, so NOAA, BOEM, Marine Mammal Commission, Navy, Office of Naval Research, NSF, Smithsonian, Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS. And I say this because it's important to know that we're getting together on a regular basis to talk about issues related to marine and coastal biodiversity. Um, we share information about biological research and monitoring um, that contributes to our federal mission and information needs, like the, the agency mission needs. Um, for environment and habitat protection, for regulatory requirements, for fisheries management, and so on, but also to discover opportunities for collaborative research with other agencies, which increasingly is more important as we're all more and more resource limited. Um, we also have a regular dialogue on improving biological data management for marine and coastal science, um, data management and accessibility, I should say, um, to coordinate on deep sea ecosystem issues, um, integrate satellite data products with in situ observations in marine and coastal environments. And um, the group is soon to launch a de demonstration projects for a marine biodiversity observation network, which we're calling BON, which is being designed to integrate across existing monitoring programs, so not to recreate the wheel, but recognition that there's a lot going on that we want to integrate. Um, and to um, fill biodiversity observing gaps and make biodiversity data even more accessible. So we're excited to be launching that. Some people consider it a follow-on to the Census of Marine Life. I don't know if I would say that, but some people do, and I think that's an interesting um, progression. So, but back to NOAA. 
Um, there's significant interest and expertise across the agency in biodiversity. It figures heavily in our long-term strategic planning documents, that sort of thing. Um, often the work is not labeled as biodiversity, so we have a team that meets um, across NOAA line offices to talk about all the work that we're doing as it does relate to biodiversity and to try to inform the kind of the biodiversity in the policy context and to say we're doing an awful lot of work. So, we view protecting our nat natural infrastructure as vital to protecting those communities and economies, fisheries, recreational opportunities that I alluded to earlier um, that take place along our coasts. Um, and Congress has charged NOAA with protecting habitat um, and species. So with this and other mandates, we're monitoring habitats and certain species for regulatory and other purposes. Um, we're looking at biodiversity across many regions, across multiple scales and habitat types and, and um, different, in different geographies. And I just wanted to offer a few examples. Um, I said scales, and I, certainly we think about fisheries, stocks, and protected species, marine mammals, um, larger species, but we aren't just thinking about fishes and whales. Increasingly, we're learning about the diversity of microorganisms and their associated biogeochemical processes and recognizing the relevance of microbes um, as we talk about ocean resiliency and marine resource management. Um, marine microbes, the term covers the diversity of microorganisms, um, and we've been trying to get a handle on what this means for NOAA. So there was a workshop back in 2012 to talk about our knowledge about marine ecosystems, microbial components, and to identify tools um, and roles that we could embrace to um, support further understanding of those. So we've got a working group in NOAA that exchanges information again um, and is developing a vision for marine microbe research priorities and strategies. So large, the large critters to very small ones. Um, habitats. In, in the National Estuarine Research Reserves, or the NEARS, we're investigating climate drivers, restoration, and anthropogenic stressors such as nutrients and water restrictions and their impacts on species distributions, invasive species, and overall community composition of coastal and estuarine biological communities. Um, the NEARS are partnering closely with the newly established Smithsonian Tenenbaum Marine Observatories Network to integrate some of the environmental data that they're collecting um, in the NEARS with biology and biodiversity data to provide a holistic view of species status trends and responses. That's something that's emerging. Um, in the sanctuaries, national marine sanctuaries, we're documenting ocean phenomena that are critical to short and long-term survival of key species. Um, some issues of current concern, for example, the slide of coral spawning, controlling invasive lionfish, documenting whale shark migration routes and feeding areas in the Gulf of Mexico. We use that work to develop a whale shark protection plan during the BP oil spill. Coral reefs are essential, spawning, nursery, breeding, and feeding grounds for norm numerous organisms. And in terms of biodiversity, um, we've got the coral reef conservation program that's um, looking at coral reef um, information and the results of an extensive research program to inform policy and management of, the, of coral reefs in the near shore. The Coral Reef Watch Program is using remote sensing and in situ tools to understand um, coral reef condition. We also have a deep sea coral research program. Um, there's some geographic focus in the Arctic. Um, where the need to assess the status of marine biodiversity um, is increasing as natural and human-induced climate um, alterations are affecting those species in very obvious ways. Um, the Distributed Biological Observatory is an interagency effort um, with heavy NOAA involvement that's um, envisioned as a change detection array along um, a gradient extending from northern Bering Sea to the Barrow Arc, and the sampling is focused on transects centered on locations of high productivity, biodiversity, and rates of biological change. So looking forward to outcomes from that effort. Um, so I mentioned marine bond, I mentioned um, the sanctuaries, the NEARS integrated ecosystem assessments. Some of you are familiar with the National System of Marine Protected Areas, which was developed to advance conservation and sustainable use of um, the nation's natural and cultural resources. Um, that's another example of where we're incorporating biodiversity information um, into decision making and community and stakeholder efforts. Um, and I need to stop. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so NOAA has a protection goal. It comes from legislative and other mandates that we're bound to respond to, but we're also a community of scientists and people with a land ethic. So I have to circle back to Leopold, um, who said that changes the, it changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. I love that. I like him. But I hope I've given you a flavor of how uh, NOAA activities and efforts in the field and at headquarters here um, inform biodiversity. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks AAAS for putting this together, and thanks you guys, thank you guys for being here. Uh, this underlines a key point that I think we have to say, and that is that no one agency does biodiversity because, frankly, no one agency can do biodiversity. In fact, no one government can do biodiversity. So we're really about trying to work across th these different activities. The administration has given us more specific guidance in the last couple of years through its PCAS report to do just that. And so this is just a great opportunity to sort of at least initially get folks together and hear what people are doing. And then we can hopefully, from events like these, start to sort of stitch things together into the bigger hole to actually do biodiversity across the federal government. So the, the first question was bi why biodiversity matters to your agency. In this case, I'm at NASA. Uh, and the short answer is because you can't do Earth system science without biodiversity. And so I work for a space agency. This is our view of Earth, how we come to Earth system science. We basically look at Earth as a planet, so sort of like we look at Mars and other, other bodies. So that we, there's this holistic sense that we started out with decades ago when we first got those pictures back from orbit, that incredible viewpoint. And it, and it tends toward that holistic Earth system view. So pictures like these and older ones going back to the Apollo era and even before were big drivers in the definition of Earth system science, so the integration of the atmosphere, the ocean, the land, and the living systems together in, in, in one whole. And so this was a, this is probably the most famous wiring diagram in, in NASA uh, Earth science history. Now that's a pretty, I realize that's a pretty fine target there, but uh, it's, it's from about 25 years ago. Francis Bretherton uh, came up with a, a very important document, Earth system science, a closer view, which was reported out not only to NASA, but also to NOAA and NSF at the time were actually thinking uh, integrated at, at those years. And this was sort of the layout, the roadmap for how NASA would do Earth system science as we were taking sort of a pivot back in the mid 80s and trying to really get our hands around. We've been doing Earth science since the 60s, but how to really do it in a more consistent, coherent way in an interagency framework. And so we put this big wiring diagram together. You probably can't read much of this, but um, you see biodiversity is not really standing out too strongly. There's a lot on biogeochemical cycling. Uh, we sort of back into it a little bit with vegetation decomposers. But the big focus was how you know, energy and how fluxes of energy and light are moved around. Sort of the big things you can you know, sort of get a handle on it. But they were at that time viewed as the big drivers for what the more physical side of the system, what was driving the train. Well, come to find out over, over time that you really can't do or system science without knowing the players, without out knowing the actors on that play of life that is so important to Earth. It's not just that biodiversity is the tail that's being wagged by the bigger dog. It actually, as we know, feeds back into the Earth system and has a big, big impact on that. So we, we came to the realization, not maybe in the last 15 years, that you got to have biodiversity in there. You got to have the players to understand the system. But then this gets to an issue of scale in that you know, we're, we're again, we're looking at things through satellite pixels and, and even the, the finer pixels and some of the commercial systems um, get you, you know, to some treetops, but you're not actually getting, you know, necessarily surrounding the critters and getting in there and handling them in, in the sense that, you know, traditionally you, you, you would do when you think of bio, biological diversity and its, and its identification. 
So scale's a challenge, you know, that's how, this is how, I guess, Na NASA would sort of look at, at the world, and this is how maybe a, a biodiversity researcher might look at it in terms of the broader systems, landscape level, the organismal scale, of course, very popular, and even down to genomics and proteomics recently, the more microbial scales. So we've got a job to do in terms of lining this up, and this is where the point about nobody can do it by themselves. Uh, while I think NASA has a tremendous role to play in catalyzing uh, a century of biology that we're really in now, the 21st century, I think could be characterized as a century of bio biology and through that a century of biodiversity. We come at it through two approaches. Directly, um, with higher and higher spatial resolution, we can see more and more, both spatially and spectrally, looking at the spectrum in different ways, getting fine higher resolution stuff, getting into the tree canopies. But most of what we do in terms of biodiversity is in concert with partners and involves indirectly assessing it through models and using our remote sensing of key environmental parameters like climate, temperature, precipitation, habitat structure, three-dimensional structure there from a LIDAR, or, or primary productivity, to essentially to box it, to categorize it, to envelope biological diversity. Now to do that, you got to have the ground data, the in situ data. Uh, and there are lots of sources, increasing sources of that. Thank goodness. Um, you know, Peter's group and others sitting around here are, are doing this for us. NSF, NatureServe, and NOAA, all, you know, lots of folks, U.S. Forest Service, certainly FIA, key data sets, characterizing that in situ biological diversity, which, without which we cannot, we with our satellite data are really sort of irrelevant. What we found, though, is what we're really lacking, while you know, the, the, the satellite record is remarkably robust for a couple of decades, what we lack are robust time series of biological data, biodiversity data, particularly those time series. We know certain few, for a few organisms we have pretty good data, things that are hunted or fished. Uh, we have some records generally going back a few decades. But other than that, there were remarkably, LTERs being an exception, but with without those few exceptions, there aren't that many time series of biological data out there to bring those remote sensing uh, data sets into conjunction with of structure, of climate, of productivity, et cetera. So this is key. Uh, the more of these, these in situ data sets that can be assembled in time series, the better off we're going to be. Um, in terms of why go global, this chart is sort of to, to you know, make the point that um, biodiversity is a global problem and there are advantages to be gained by looking at it in the global context. Typically, traditionally, biodiversity has been plot level up. That's important. That's how you get to know it, maybe from a lab bench up. But there also, you can make a strong case for looking at it top down, and that it is a global phenomenon. Biodiversity loss is a global phenomenon. Therefore, it needs to be addressed globally. Assembling those global data sets uh, are key. I'll, I'll let you read that there, basically from both the the producer of the data standpoint as well as the consumer of the data's standpoint, I think you can make an argument that assembling global information, global context, not just because I work for an agency that happens to have global data sets, but because the problem demands to be approached from a global, context, from a global standpoint. So just to get to the last bit was sort of what you, how does your agency do biodiversity, getting very technical here. We, we divide ourselves up into four large areas or four large themes. The one on the right there is science. Uh, I, if science has four divisions, astrophysics, planetary helophysics, and space sciences, and then earth science. I reside in the earth science uh, division. And within that, we have uh, basically the folks doing the technology development, the flight program guys, which the sort of 800-pound gorilla in terms of the funding and building and launching things. Then we have a research and analysis program which funds research using that satellite imagery and that's where the biodiversity program that I manage sits. We're a uh, competitive peer review uh, soliciting organization that gets in proposals and, and, and funds them through that mechanism for basic research on biodiversity, essentially a macroecology or a big biogeography program largely. And then there's an applied sciences program which tries to take the results from the research side and other elements, the technology elements, and spin them out to broader uses within the federal family, uh, multi-state level, multinational organizations, basically to, to allow our products to be used by um, other organizations. So it has a very applied bent. In this case, think natural resource management, fisheries, land management, uh, et cetera. And that's, I think, all I got. But the take-home message is 
We have to work together if we're going to be successful in this domain. It's been fantastic working with Penny on the Dimensions of Biodiversity program. Um, they allowed us to come on with them and, and partner on a couple of solicitations, which was fantastic. Gabrielle mentioned Marine Bond. Very excited about this opportunity to get something going. Again, that's an interagency effort that Noah and Gabrielle really pulled together. Uh, we use Forest Service data. USDA ARS has been a longtime partner, so it's great to be here. All right, marching along. All right, I understand I'm the only thing between you and the reception, so I will, um, <laughs> oh right, we have some questions and answers, I guess. <laughs> that was lucky. Um, and I, I, put the, um, I put the planet up, up there for you, uh, Woody, just to <clears throat> acknowledge that we do uh, at NSF support all kinds of uh, scales. Uh, but I, I, I had trouble, I struggled a little, you know, why biodiversity matters to the National Science Foundation. We are a fundamental basic science agency uh, and and our our um, customers, if you will, uh, are people in academe. So we support you know uh, universities, colleges, and researchers to do this kind of fundamental research. So because they are interested in it, uh, that is uh, important to our agency. So um, so today I'm going to give you a little bit of the of the context um, in which our research programs are embedded. And then I'm going to talk about just a few of them because uh, of time constraints, so uh, all of this information, of course, on the web. Um, first, um, I have been uh, at NSF for about 23 years, and uh, just in that short piece of my career, uh, I've seen changes, and these should not be unfamiliar to all of you. So the, the planet is changing. There's, there's uh, habitat fragmentation and uh, ice melting at the, at the poles, and we've got you know, kudzu uh, engulfing cars and, <laughs> and uh, patterns of, you know, fire are changing and, and I could go on and on. But you, you're, you're well aware, I am sure, uh, that, that global climate change and invasives and all of these kinds of things are affecting uh, the biological diversity um, of the planet in a variety of different ways. Um, some of the things that have come more recently to light in, um, in my observation of what's being funded and the findings of our, our research community, uh, we've, we're seeing now things like rapid evolution that's modifying the traits and dispersal of organisms. And this is something we didn't really think about about a decade ago. We have actually novel ecosystems that never existed before that are emerging because you got these feedbacks al along several different scales of time and space happening simultaneously. And so, you know, we're now starting to study things that, again, didn't really exist uh, recently. There's, there's changing nature of species interactions and ecological functions. This is happening in a lot of different uh, types of systems. So, so the, and these are just a, 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 a short handful of, of the kinds of changes that we're, we're starting to see in the, in the research that we're funding. And things that are coming in the door, uh, the subjects are much more interdisciplinary now than they were a decade or two ago. The scales go, of course, we've heard a little bit, we go, they go now from the genome um, all the way up to, you know, even continental scales. And as, as our National Ecological Observatory Network, the NEON is built out, data at the continental scale is just going to be pumping out there for the research community to use. So, so we have gone, we've started definitely to go beyond the plot scale, but it's a huge challenge because the data that is coming in is in, in you know, form and function just, just enormously different. Um, and then the scope of the research is changing as well. Um, part of this is due to the interdisciplinary nature of the, of the projects that we see coming in, but we're also seeing um, fundamental research on what used to be considered you know, applied problems. How do, how do, what's the range of these organisms? How are they changing? And, and what is causing that in terms of ecology or evolutionary biology? Um, this is, uh, the, the take home message uh, of this slide is simply that we're not a very big agency. It's about a $7 billion agency, but we support on the order of 200,000 scientists and engineers and students and so on. 
So we are an important but small agency in terms of the academic uh, community. Uh, I'm the division director in environmental biology. Our um, uh, uh, budget is a, around $140 million a year, so we're a small piece of a small agency, uh, but I have to say it's, it's an exciting, exciting place to work. Um, we support the range of, you know, stuff that's alive out there on the planet. We, um, we don't do the ocean sciences stuff, we don't do the paleo, but pretty much everything else on populations and species, uh, systematic biology, communities, ecosystems, long-term research, all of that stuff happens within the, the division, and it's, it's quite exciting. So today I wanted to just mention a few programs that we have so that you get a flavor of, of what's out there. And the first one that I'm, I'm going to talk about is um, actually a core program. So a core program at NSF is one that has sort of a, a wide, you know, uh, arms wide kind of a, a scope. Um, and you can come in with any idea that you think is interesting and important and could be transformative to how we understand that. So the systematics and biodiversity science um, uh, cluster within DEB supports research that, that advances our understanding of biodiversity. So we've got taxonomy, we've got phylogenetics, and these are some of the questions um, that this program covers. So sort of the what's out there, you know, where does it live, how are these organisms related, um, how did uh, evolution lead to the patterns that we see around the, the planet, around the globe, and, and how can phylogenetic history, knowing that of these organisms that are out there, shed light on the evolutionary patterns and processes in, for example, sister groups and so on. So um, there's many, many more things that are covered within this core area, but this is this is a, a big, you know, this is like $25 million worth of research going out the door every year, and it's not governed by NSF in terms of the specifics of it. So that's a core program. Um, this is a, a special program, okay? This is a 10-year campaign. It's called Dimensions of Biodiversity, and we initiated it a few years ago, 2010, and actually I think we had um, Woody and his group came in for a couple years. Uh, we've got uh, partnerships with Brazil, with China, with other NSF divisions, and the idea here is to try to hit that target in the middle of the Venn diagram. So these projects are very difficult to do because they have to integrate the genetic, phylogenetic, and functional dimensions of biodiversity um, in, a, in a single project. And at first, uh, people found it quite difficult, and, and we heard uh, amazing reviews from the panel, like um, one quote was, this, this program is going to accomplish in 10 years what would have taken 50 years doing business as usual, because it's sort of force-fitting these communities together. There was a little resistance, as you can imagine, um, and it's, it's not a huge program. It's, it's on the order of between 20 and $30 million, depending on what our partners contribute to each year, but it's a good program. I just wanted to uh, give a quick advertisement. This is the um, abstract book that, that um, came out last year, and this is uh, available on the NSF website, and Karen, who's sitting out there, uh, has just finished uh, putting together the, the uh, new one for this year, and uh, it's, being, it's in clearance, and so that'll be out very, very soon. And these are wonderful abstract books, because each, each project has a page, and you can learn you know, kind of what have we funded in this program, and what are the early findings, which are really, really transformational and exciting. Um, the last uh, program that I want to mention is a brand new program called Genealogy of Life, or Go Life, as we like to say. Um, and this is, this is really fundamental systematic biology, but it's going to be extremely important to comparative biology. And I think when we look back in 20 years or 25 years, this program is going to shine as one of the really most important things that, that NSF funded. We are looking for an open access, universal genealogy of all life, and the idea is that you have this up and integrate existing and new um, forming data layers. So I've got genomic, phenomic, spatial, ecological, temporal, and, and many more. So you can imagine all the different data layers that would be connected to this online accessible phylogenetic framework, and you could suddenly start to look not just into the past, but out into the future 
of life and where the, the phylogenetics seem to be taking you in terms of biogeography and, and you know, predictive modeling of, of uh, range expansions or contractions or what have you. Um, so I could imagine that at some point this would be very important to people with interest in um, conservation biology, for example, to, to plug in some of the organisms um, you know, that, that they're interested in and see what this kind of uh, framework is able to provide. We've just gotten the proposals in. The panels are in just another month or two. Uh, and so we don't know yet. This is, a, this is like a teaser for the future, but, uh, but we're pretty excited about Go Live because it it's brand new and you know, we think this is going to, be a, it's going to be huge as it develops. So that's, uh, that's my formal comments. I just want to mention we, we also support dynamics of coupled natural and human systems, our CNH program. We fund the uh, ecology and evolution of infectious diseases. We have an ecology, a population community ecology program, an ecosystems program, a long-term research program, um, what did I forget, uh, evolutionary processes program. So we have a lot that's related to biodiversity, many, many layers. Um, uh, in DEB, and I would be delighted to answer uh, questions once we reconvene up here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny. I'd like to invite our speakers to come up to the stage. Just get this. So we have some microphones. We have 20 minutes until uh, our reception, and we have two microphones, one on the aisle and one on the side uh, for questions from the audience. But before uh, we get to, that, to those, um, Sarah and I actually prepared a few questions just sort of to get the, the ball rolling here. Um, as uh, all of us have heard, obviously biodiversity covers a broad range of contexts from forest management uh, to food security and agriculture, international development, ecosystem services, global remote sensing, basic science. Uh, and it's not just about uh, you know, preserving one particular furry critter or another depending on, uh, or not so furry critter depending on your interests. Um, but given that uh, the Science and Technology Policy Fellowships uh, program is sponsoring the, this event, um, and both Sarah and I are policy fellows at different agencies, we had uh, several questions that are tied to the relationship between science and policy. Um, so my first question to each of the panelists, and maybe each of them can give a, a brief response, is what is the relationship between research and policy at your agency? Uh, for those of you who are more research oriented, how does uh, the research get picked up by policymakers? And for those that are more policy oriented, how is research used to guide decision making? And maybe we can start with Sandy. Can you hear me? Okay. How about now? No? Okay. Well, we have a research division in the, in the Forest Service, uh, R&D, and uh, typically uh, the clients of our research division include not only our national forest systems, those are the forests that you're most familiar with, but also the clients are other corporate uh, interests, uh, non-governmental agencies, private landowners, and typically what they do is they tackle uh, basic science to applied science questions. And the way they inform policy uh, at the Forest Service, and we have two general um, policy issues that we deal with. One is the, the allocation of funds, and then the other is, well, you know, the, the distribution of those funds and changing our policies so that we get the results that we hope to see on the land uh, scape out there. And so what we have is we have uh, research organized around sort of the different programs that that we are involved in. We have uh, uh, disturbance programs, insects, disease, fire uh, related programs. And so those researchers that are in those programmatic areas develop new knowledge and that knowledge then gets uh, transferred to us at the Washington DC level. We talk about what it is that, that they're learning and then if we need to change our policies uh, we do so, but it, it's an informed decision-making process, and we rely heavily not only on our research arm to inform the management arm of the agency, but also we we uh, rely on other agencies and the and, you know there's other non-governmental organizations that have their scientists that are doing work, and we we grab the information from wherever we can and uh, use it to uh, change policy and allocate our resources. So, thank you, Sandy. Peter. 
Yes, well, uh, the Agricultural Research Service is a, is a in-house intramural uh, agency. We have about 8,000 employees, 2,000 scientists. And one of our imp more important roles is providing tools and solutions for other governmental or, or state agencies for policy issues. Examples would be uh, we do an extensive amount of work with the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, APHIS, to identify uh, and devise control strategies for in invasive uh, plants, insects, animals that threaten biodiversity and, and, and threaten U.S. agriculture. Uh, the data we generate are used by other so-called action agencies such as EPA. Uh, and uh, part of our, our agency that really doesn't deal with biodiversity but uh, has a tremendous impact on, on uh, policy is our, our nutrition scientists. So we're responsible for the uh, My Food Pyramid and now mm -hmm. it's the My Food Plate and so that sets really nutrition policy, the, the data does. Uh, we provide the data and then other agencies uh, set policy in terms of nutritional standards. And of course that feeds back into what sort of crops, livestock, et cetera, one needs to uh, generate uh, for the uh, U.S. populace a uh, well-balanced diet. So those are just some of the ways that our our research data are used in, in policy decisions and to underpin decision making. Thank you, Peter. Barbara. Um, yes. Um, I mentioned that at USAID we're in the process of developing a uh, biodiversity and development research agenda. And the intent of this is not just to help shape our own actions, but we really want to open it up and we have external reviewers. This would be a general research agenda for others involved, also for development and biodiversity to take a look at it. The intent is to really build that evidence base that conservation has other development outcomes. Um, and so through that, trying to um, change this big ship that we're a part of, our biodiversity budget is small compared to the overall agency budget. But this biodiversity policy recognizes that unsound development is a major driver of biodiversity loss. So we're trying to build the evidence that we need to have more or different approaches in other parts of our agency. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Gabrielle? I, I think it, it's, it's dependent on which part of NOAA um, we're talking about because different parts of NOAA have different legislative, um, you know, or other mandates that they're responding to, and um, certainly, you know, there's fisheries science centers all over the country that are informing um, the management of fish stocks um, through their research activities and the information that they feed back to the science advisor and other headquarters staff um, and share amongst themselves and share with fisheries management councils in the region. So um, there, there's a, a whole um, kind of structure built around, I think, fishery policy and how science informs that. There's other parts of NOAA. Um, we've been thinking a lot about ecological forecasting and um, where it's important to be thinking about that for which topics. And um, so increasingly, I would say we're doing more cross NOAA conversations with kind of policy staffs and um, the research side of the house to say um, where we see emerging issues and um, whether we're doing science that can answer some policy questions that we're hearing um, or whether we need to sort of change priorities with regard to the science that we're pursuing. Um, so there's a bit of a feedback loop from, from what I've observed and I'm speaking generally uh, not specifically with regard to biodiversity per se. Um, in some cases, we rely on um, outside advisory groups. There's a very formal process for putting those in place, um, but once they're established, we can look to them for um, advice as to you know emerging policy issues and the importance of certain of research in certain areas. Um, just some thoughts. Thank you, Woody. So the Earth Science Division, NASA, is an R&D, a research and development 
uh, activity, and our primary purpose is to provide policy relevant information uh, to policymakers. On the although we do have the Applied Sciences Program that I mentioned, in which we seek to partner with other agencies, state, federal, um, multinational um, NGOs, etc to feed our products into their processes, their decision support tools, their, their management frameworks in some way. But we do that in partnership with them, to hopefully help them do a, a better job. And so at that point, we get into supporting conservation biology and other efforts, um, directly and indirectly, through the uh, provision of the information to those users. Thank you, Woody. Penny? Right, so NSF is a basic science agency and, and, and our constituency is the academic community. So we don't, um, we don't really do environmental policy. We, uh, we think more about science policy. Uh, and so the, the science policy questions for us are really, um, where should we uh, put the uh, burden of our funding? Uh, and for biodiversity, uh, we, we make the case um, pretty well, I think, that we should be funding uh, a broad scope of biodiversity research that has relevance to uh, questions of importance to all of these communities that you just heard from. Uh, and in fact, our two review criteria are intellectual merit and broader impacts. And so many of the grant proposals that we end up funding uh, have relevance. That's not why they're doing the research. They're trying to uncover or discover or understand something that we never have really understood before. But they are also relevant because they underpin some of the decisions that the, the mission agencies um, need to make, as well as private sector and so on. Thank you, Penny. All right, I'd like to open up the floor of questions. Uh, if you have a question, please approach one of the microphones, identify yourself, and give your affiliation. Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm uh, Tim Resch, uh, work for USAID in the Africa Bureau. Um, as I know, whether uh, Woody or, or, or Sandy uh, is uh, listening, I got a, a strong sense of, of from the U.S. for the U.S. And so I was uh, wondering about how the institutions think through cooperation and research emanating uh, and policy decisions emanating from the international organizations. Uh, FAO, World Bank, uh, 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 UNESCO, uh, uh, IUCN, uh, or, or such, or, and similarly, how we connect with the, the, uh, the British and the French and the Chinese and the Indian and the Australian research and how we um, kind of think globally uh, on how we access information, process it, uh, apply it here in the United States and also uh, as part of our responsibility as part of the international community, share our domestic findings with the rest of the world. So again, uh, we're an earth science agency, so it, it, by definition our mandate is, is to do global work there. I think all of the agencies here, I think even NSF, are part of the Group on Earth Observations, yep. GEO. Uh, which um, NASA, NOAA, and all of us sort of play roles in one way or another, in which we're trying to coordinate observations, specifically focused on observations of the Earth, uh, in situ, airborne, satellite, et cetera, to get a better handle on, on the health of the planet. Within that construct, the biodiversity is actually one of, I think, nine societal benefit areas. So there is a focus on biodiversity, and there's something called GeoBond, a geobiodiversity observation network, which is trying to coordinate specifically biodiversity observations around the globe. And the marine bond effort that Gabrielle mentioned in her talk is a national effort to feed into that global activity. Basically, the way you put together, we've decided, we think anyway, the way you put together a global biodiversity observation network is to leverage national and regional networks and then try to stitch them across the top to, to internetwork things. And so, that's certainly one way. I mean, we're all, we all have global aspects to what we, we do, and you know, we cooperate um, with other space agencies around the world in terms of trying to share the load in observing this planet. It's very expensive to, to launch and, and operate satellites, so anything we can do to, to lessen those costs is important. We've been working for about 20, 30 years through something called Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, or COS, to do that. And so I guess for NASA, COS and GEO would be big activities. I'm sure everybody has other four that they work in 
at this table uh, that could, um, you know, to address that, that challenge. But it is, again, biodiversity is certainly bigger than the U.S. government, bigger than any agency in the government, bigger than the U.S. government, and bigger than, frankly, all the U.S. corporately again, trying to get its handle around that. So it's a, it's a global effort. So with, with the Forest Service, um, there's a couple of avenues that we pursue. One, our research scientists assist other countries with problems that they may have. Uh, either on an individual basis or sometimes a programmatic basis. We have an international uh, programs division of the agency, and they specifically work with other countries. And the other thing we do is, is countries come in and uh, visit us, and so we host those delegations, and they sit down with specific issues, biodiversity for one. Uh, the Koreans came in last year, we're, we're asking about that particular issue. So. Uh, you know, and I don't completely know what we, throughout the agency, we are all doing, because our social scientists and our economists are also fully engaged. Uh, and then there's an organization, IUFRO, which you're probably familiar with, and we, we are involved in that as well. So there's a, a number of, of ways that we work with the world community on uh, biodiversity issues and species conservation. Thank you, Sandy. Have another question from the audience, please? Sure, thanks very much for this panel. So I'm curious about how some of these different biodiversity projects are launched. So I know, for instance, with NSF, there are certain grants that you can apply for, and then you, know, you, you, you take the, the money and you can go and implement your research project. But some of you mentioned NGOs and collaborations with other governments and, and, and whatnot. So I was wondering how would, say, NGOs and other partners partnerships develop with these government agencies for biodiversity-specific projects? And to what extent are there basically just formal channels, and to what extent are there informal channels through which these projects are launched? Thank you. And if I can ask the panelists to speak into the microphone so that the audience can hear clearly. Thank you. Um, so there's probably no single answer. I, I've been asked many times, how do, you, how do you get an initiative started at NSF? And I said, well, I wish I knew one way to do that. You can do it any number of different ways. And, and basically, you have to be entrepreneurial and opportunistic. And I think, I think that is actually the answer to your question as well, is um, do both parties that are interested in going into partnership have something to gain? Uh, this is something I've learned. It seems so simple, and yet, you know, we get pressure. I'm sure you guys do too. You know, do more partnering. You can leverage your money, and so on and so forth. And so, um, it, I've discovered that if both parties don't have something to gain by the partnership, it doesn't actually go anywhere. You can sign a piece of paper, but if you don't, if you're not both benefiting in some way, and that's where you have to figure out what is the the overlap point between what the uh, the, the private foundation, for example, or, or whatever the, the other unit is and the federal agency is, where do their missions overlap, coincide, complement each other? And, and that's where you start the discussions. And I, I think the, 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 the most successful initiatives aren't really the ones that kind of come down raining on us from above, although we always try to get some of that money. Um, but it's mostly uh, the ones that are built on relationships. You know, we know each other, we talk, we say, what are you doing, what are you doing? And, um, and that's actually how a lot of, of, um, of partnerships initiate. And maybe they don't all result in funding initiatives or, or actual active projects, but they may lay the groundwork for something down the road. So that would be my answer. It's, it's not a real answer, but it's, it's, uh, it's, I think, how things work. Does anyone else want to add any comments? No? Yeah. Okay, Barbara, yes. Yeah. Um, no, certainly there are um, open competitions for biodiversity programming. Uh, certainly USAID and I'm sure the other agencies um, are involved in that. But I did want to, to follow up on, on this last comment. I know NSF and USAID, our mission in Indonesia, were working really hard to help the Indonesian government stand up a similar organization like the National Science Foundation. USAID was very interested, NSF was very interested. In fact, we happened to be in Indonesia at the same time a little over a year ago. But you have a third party, the Indonesian government. Here's some of the challenges. There were some individuals who were very interested in it, but essentially I don't think they could get their act together. And so we have to give them more time. Uh, maybe the timing wasn't right. So you have to have the right relationships, and sometimes the timing has to be uh, appropriate. And I think there's a political election coming up in Indonesia, and so everything just stops. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Jerry? Hi, um, I'm Jerry Unger. I'm with the Society for Conservation Biology. 
Thanks for um, all your comments. I guess I just have a, a question to you all. I mean, the title of the panel was Why Biodiversity Matters to the United States Government, and I'd like to hear you comment about how your agencies bring it home to the United States people outside of the United States government and the people that are paying all of our salaries, the taxpayers and the public interface with um, students, agencies, and, uh, and the people that are being affected by biodiversity in the states. Since we're running a little bit short on time, maybe one or two of you can respond yeah. to that and we'll take maybe one question after that. Anyone has something compelling? I'd say not very oh, well <laughs> um, in the NASA case. Uh, we, we could do a much better job of communicating <laughs> what we do um, with regard to biodiversity. And, and sometimes that's a, a condition of the degree to which uh, biodiversity is viewed, uh, I mean, outside the government is viewed as an important issue. And so maybe SCB and, and uh, the biodiversity community here in the federal government are, are, need to, are allies in trying to raise the uh, importance of biodiversity or the awareness of biodiversity as an important issue uh, to the American people. Yeah, I, I'll just add briefly that, that um, you know, we work very closely with our public affairs office to make sure press releases go out when, when big publications appear. Uh, it, but, but basically, there's only so much you can do in the push of, of uh, information. Um, and, and, and a lot more uh, transfer occurs in the pull where the person is interested and reads something. Um, and so, uh, so there, there is within NSF the, um, the uh, uh, Directorate for Education and Human Resources. Um, they do fund a number of, of project activities that relate to biodiversity. But I will say, as Woody said, it's very difficult to push out to you know, a nation the, uh, the size of ours and, and beyond. And so, uh, so I, I don't think we're quite there yet. I'd love to hear your suggestions. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Noah Matz. I work on a biodiversity policy for Defenders of Wildlife here in DC. Um, this year or, uh, marked, or last year marked the 40th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and from our experience, uh, this, this has been a great panel, very positive about biodiversity. Um, from our experience, the federal government, particularly action agencies, view compliance with the ESA and protection of biodiversity as a burden. Um, so it's very refreshing to, to see all this great work that you guys are doing. Uh, I have a completely different question, though. <laughs> um, so you guys are all, all of you have talked about the, the data and science that you guys are working on. Um, and it seems like a lot of you have uh, great cross-pollinations going on. Um, We've also talked about how important data is and science is to inform policy. One of the unsung, I think, um, transformative initiatives of the Obama administration has been its open government initiatives and, and the establishment of data.gov. Um, the promise of cracking open all of the data and information of the federal government is, is pretty huge. Uh, my experience in uh, navigating data.gov, though, is, is that the promise is falling short uh, in, in, in its implementation. And so um, just going back to you, A, um, is this even talked about within your agencies, uh, not just complying with the executive order, but the, the idea of, of, of really unleashing all of your information to the public to be able to capture that with new technologies, with the field of big data, you know, it, we don't have to have these, these conferences to kind of bump into each other and figure out, oh, you have this data set? No, this is all out there, and people be mashing it up in really cool ways to inform our work on biodiversity. So, you know, are these conversations going on within the agencies, and, and what do you see within the next two years? Do you, do you see a rapid transformation of, of that whole sphere? Thanks. Peter? Well, th thanks for the question. Um, uh, our uh, undersecretary's uh, name is Kathy Wotecki, and she's also the chief scientist in the USDA. And one of her initiatives in the last few years that she's pushed is the GODAN initiative. It's, it's an acronym meaning essentially globally open data for agriculture and, and nutrition. Uh, she, and, and she can certainly speak to it much more eloquently than I can, but she's worked with her counterpart chief scientists in the, the G8 and G20 countries to have publicly generated uh, data made available globally for, for use. 
So that's at that level. <clears throat> at the level of USDA RS, we run some of the largest public access uh, databases for uh, agricultural data. Um, uh, environmental uh, measurements of uh, nutritional loads in, in, in watersheds, for example. Uh, those that I'm most familiar with have to do with genetics and genetic resources. So uh, all the data on the uh, germplasm resource information network called GRIN, where is the entry point for scientists and researchers to, to order germplasm, that's all public domain, uh, free access. We also uh, run uh, the larger um, crop and animal genome databases. So the crop genome databases that if you conduct research on maize or soybeans or wheat or rice, then you're familiar with names like gramine, soy base, maize GDB, and, and others. Uh, requirement to have those data, deposit those data, is for them to be freely accessible. So that, that's our policy and has been our policy within ARS and uh, above our level, uh, our undersecretary has really championed this not only within the U.S. but uh, internationally. Thank you, Peter. Would anyone else like that remark? I'd like to speak to that. So in the ocean observing community, we very much have a culture of um, working hard to make data accessible and interoperable. And um, so I sit in the Integrated Ocean Observing System Program office. And while I don't emphasize data management in my daily work, we have a team that does. And um, we have quite a number of regional partners that include um, academia, NGOs, um, folks doing a lot of research and work. Um, traditionally, it's been physical, chemical oceanography, but increasingly, we're looking at the biological data and how to deal with that. So um, we work closely with the Ocean Biogeographic Information System that's um, run out of USGS. It also has an international component to that effort. Um, we work within global circles in the Global Ocean Observing System and also in GEO on the data management side. And, also with um, the folks at data.gov to talk about how to make data um, interoperable and accessible. Um, I would say from the perspective of, uh, well, having dealt with at least tangentially biological data management for a number of years, um, it's really hard. So it's um, moving a little bit slowly. Uh, in the biodiversity interagency working group that we have um, that focuses on marine and coastal biodiversity, we. Um, this has been a topic of conversation over the past years, which we're resurrecting again this week, um, to, to really talk about how, what's the federal kind of architecture? How are we bringing in data from many, many sources to make it available? So in the spirit of your question, I think we're thinking very hard about it. All right, thank you. Oh, last, last word. Uh, just, <laughs> just to add a little bit to this, uh, you know, with the declining budgets that our agency faces and other agencies face, we are looking at what are the core questions that we need to be pursuing. And then in that pursuit, we have to start looking at other agencies and what kind of data sets do they have and how compatible can we be with what they've got so that we can be more efficient in, in our use of resources. And right now, what we're looking at is revamping our inventory monitoring and assessment program to streamline it in, in an effort to get at just those core questions we need to be paying attention to, one of which is the maintenance of biodiversity. So we're working on it. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I'd like to give a final round of applause to our entire panel, commend them on their wonderful presentations.